Hi, I'm Sunil Badami, a doctoral candidate in writing at New South Writing, the new brand name for the creative writing program at New South Wales. We've got an exciting program of some of Australia's best and best known writers coming to New South Wales in the New South Writers Seminar Series. And we're very happy and excited to be hosting one of Australia's best known and best loved authors, Tom Keneally. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> Tom, I suppose you probably um, uh, you've been writing for quite a long time, and at an age when most writers will probably be um, retiring, you've come out with not one, but two new books. Uh, the first, The People's Train, which is a novel set in sleepy post-war um, uh, or 1900s Brisbane, and it tells the story of Artem Semsarov, who was a, a revolutionary in the Russian Revolution. And uh, the first of a three-part projected history of Australia called Australia Origins to Eureka. Now, where did you find the time to write not one but two books? I, you know, I think I found the time by not being as obsessively uh, directed towards work as I was when I was young. Um, what saved me when I was younger uh, as a writer was having kids who virtually said, we don't care how your book's going, we want you to take us to the beach. And now I've got grandchildren who do the same. If I work long hours, I find myself giving me license, giving myself license to do a cryptic crossword here, to read a couple of paragraphs of a favorite author there. Whereas if you've got a limited time, you just write. And um, so, you know, it, it seems excessive and folly to have a couple come out at the same time. It's probably both, but that's just the way I am. So what does your work day involve? It generally involves um, uh, avoiding email until I get two or three angry reminders. Uh, it involves pretty, starting pretty much on the text uh, that I'm working on. Um, now, when you're writing two books at once, I find that you can't give the morning to one and the afternoon to the other because it doesn't work like that. The, the novel and the um, history are your lovers or you are their lover and they're not willing to share you uh, throughout a day. So you tend to write on your novel for a week and your history for four or five days and then back to the novel. Of course, the important thing about a novel uh, is that you have to keep contact with the characters. You have to keep your subconscious in contact with what's happening in the novel. And that's why I think it's better to write a little bit over an extended period than to say, take three weeks now and write a lot, and then three weeks in six months' time and write a lot. M maybe, I mean, for every rule you make, uh, there's a rule that's broken by some brilliant person out there. But that's, that's what I find. Uh, now, Do you have a word limit every day? Uh, yeah, I have one in my head. Uh, uh, but again, I'm not as doctrinaire about it as I used to be. If I'm writing a first draft of a novel, say, I love to do, my aim is 1,500 words of, nov of new, of first draft a day, uh, or at least 1,000 words. If I don't do at least 1,000, I get the guilts. Mm -hmm. And writer's guilt is a terrible thing, and it's universal where, wherever we come from. Uh, you've got this terrible, here am I, an Irish Catholic with a terrible Protestant work ethic when it comes to <laughs> getting my thousand, um, uh, thousand words out. Uh, but enough uh, Irish Catholic guilt to keep you going. Uh, yes, indeed. And uh, then the second draft, you see, I'm the sort of writer who doesn't quite know what's happening in the first draft. And that's why I say to young writers, begin. Don't think you need another course. Just begin. Mm. Take the course by all means. It will enrich what, you, what you're doing. Mm. Uh, but, um, you know, start. Mm. Grab it. Um, 
the fact that you don't know precisely what's going to happen is, is part of the enterprise. And it can be very bewildering, very disorienting, and even very depressing to find out, the, to write the first draft, to find out what the book's about. Then writing the second draft, you're more certain. Mm. Um, and the speed is greater. And writing the third draft, uh, more so still. And then I generally do a final polish, and often a, a lot of writing at that stage, although a lot of it is simply correcting paragraphs. I wish I could be the sort of writer they reckon that um, Graham Greene was, who could write mm. 500 words on a given day and that was basically the 500. They were basically the 500 that were going to turn up in the finished work. He had such a sense of his own plot before he began. That is a genuine gift. He was blessed by the gods. The rest of us have to blunder. Uh, we're like feeling people in a blackened room. We can tell they're bald, maybe, but we can't tell anything. We can't tell the quality of their smile. We can't tell the nature of their eyes. Uh, and we find out by writing it. That's a great answer. Now, tell me, I was, I've been struck, especially in relation to your work, which has generally concentrated on historical fiction, as well as the histories, um, about Pierre Rickman's writing of Simon Lays a few years ago, saying that historians are the novelists of the past and novelists are the historians of the present. How do you think that applies to historical fiction? Well, uh, I've always thought that historical fiction was most valid insofar as it reflected on the present. So I've written a lot of contemporary, certain number of contemporary novels, and novels which I don't see as primarily historic. For example, I, I wrote a a uh, book about my uh, grandparents settling in the Maclay Valley, and it's set in 1900, 1901. And to me, since I was born in 1935, that doesn't seem historical, whereas to someone your age, it would seem an historical novel. But above all, I've always thought that uh, in writing, say, The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, uh, at the time I wrote it, we were engaged in Vietnam. At the time those events happened, we were engaged in the Boer War. There was great political conflict over both those issues. At the time I started to write it, uh, Aboriginal health and housing uh, was in the same hole it was in 1900, and our understanding of Aboriginal culture was um, minimal. Uh, and our sympathy for it was minimal. And so there were echoes between the late 1960s and 1900, which I thought were, um, uh, you know, unanswerably valid to write about. Uh, I, I thought that the story of Jimmy Governor, which beca who became Jimmy Blacksmith, uh, was an encapsulation uh, of everything that was wrong in our relationship to Aboriginal. Now, when you're young, you're game to think things like that. Uh, you know, you need a certain amount of arrogance to write. And when you're young, you ought to think, everyone's got it wrong till now, and I'm going to get it right, because you need that sort of obsession to get you through the writing. If you didn't think like that, uh, then you wouldn't have the stamina to get there. So, um, I take it Artem Sentsarov is not based on Lawrence Springborg? No, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, Artem Sentsarov is based on a man called Artem Sergeyev. And what I started working idly on was the fact that Brisbane has all these connections to the Russian Revolution. First of all, a Brisbane department store's owner's daughter married Kerensky, the leader of the Russian the government. The provisional government. The provisional government between uh, nine, uh, February 1917 and the Bolshevik uh, uh, Revolution. And uh, through looking into her, I discovered that there was a nest of escaped Tsarist prisoners of various political, generally leftist direction in Brisbane, 
and that one of them went on to participate very heavily in the Russian Revolution to the extent that he was a member of the Central Committee, so on. Now, the, the juxtaposition between Brisbane, which when I was a kid we thought of not as a desirable place but the ultimate hick town, you know, barely more than a village, we Sydney side. Imagine that. And, and uh, now, to have then, even before I was born, a connection between Brisbane and St. Petersburg was fascinating to me. The, the idea that there was only two degrees of separation between the Kremlin and Joe Jelly Peterson, I couldn't resist that. But also, I couldn't resist the idea of what a wonderful idea Marxism seemed uh, before it ran uh, head on into the flaws mm. of various people involved in the revolution. Uh, Lenin, I think, uh, a lot of people will be offended by this, I thought was a very flawed character, mm. and even more demented and paranoid and strange uh, was Stalin, of course, and the fruits of that we, the 20th century, were burdened with. So I wanted to tell the story. I've always been attracted to beliefs that fill the whole horizon mm. for a person, and, and uh, Marxism was one of those beliefs that were uh, th almost theological, that were uh, almost like a visit from God, saying, yes, my son, there is a millennium at the end of all this. I heard, I heard a great quote by G.K. Chesterton, who said that a man who believes in nothing will believe anything. And I think it was in reference to Christopher Hitchens, <laughs> who has a theological belief in uh, the Iraq War and atheism. Now, what has intrigued me about the novel was that you go from the perspective of Artem to the perspective of Paddy, a, uh, a, an Irish Catholic socialist journalist who accompanies him from Australia, from Brisbane, to witness the revolution. Now, why is it that you changed voice at that point? Uh, it was partly because I thought it was a good artistic balance. Artyom talks about Australia, his adventures in Australia take up about two-thirds of the book. Uh, I thought it would, so he is a Russian looking at Australia, I thought it made sense to have an Australian looking at Russia. But also, although I've been to Russia, although uh, I've, um, I know Cyrillic script, although I've been to Siberia, although I've spent a lot of time with Russians, uh, I still felt uh, that it was good for me to write about Russia from the point of view of a man who's entering it as a baby, who is learning uh, the language the way a baby would, one word at a time, uh, who is um, uh, perplexed by the culture, who is perplexed by, the, uh, by what he encounters. And so that's why I did it as well. Okay, well, just finishing up, I mean, you're obviously a great influence on a great many Australian writers, and I'm sure that many of the students, like myself tonight, who will be watching you, will take away a lot of the lessons. We may see some more tales of Russians lost in wool and gabba <laughs> in the future. But who are your big influences? Oh, uh, when I was young, Graham Greene, I'm still a great admirer of uh, Patrick White. Graham Greene's the sort of writer who makes it look so easy, you think I can do that, mm. and then you find out you can't. Mm -hmm. uh, and Evelyn Waugh, um, uh, I, at this stage of my life, Toni Morrison I love. I like John Irving a lot too. Um, I'm, I've gone back to reading all the books I've had to pretend to have read. Uh, Dostoevsky's The Idiot, I think, is dynamite. I've read all my Conrad again, and I think The Secret Agent is a tremendous secret agent book. It's, it's a, a case of John le Carre, eat your heart out. So there's some of the influences on me, but a lot of poets too, William Butler Yeats. I love the Australians, Judith Wright, uh, Kenneth Slezer, 
AD Hope. It's very interesting to me that we who are supposed to be hard-handed yobbos have had so many great poets. Well, in the I remember uh, Randolph Stowe writing in uh, Merry Go Round in the Sea, you know, it was a young country and it was a sad country, it was a good country for poets. Yes. <laughs> and also historical novelists, Tom, thank you so much for joining us here at New South Riding and thank you for joining us too. I hope that even though you may not have been able to make the event today, you will join us soon in April of 2010 when we'll be hosting the wonderful Australian writer, or equally wonderful Australian writer, David Maloof. In the meantime, please make sure you look out for The People's Train, which is available in paperback in all good stores now. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.